Hi everyone, welcome to this talk that will be an introduction to 6244 Python stats. Um, my name is Maya, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I work on the Emerging Technologies Security Team and you can find me on social media on Twitter, Mastodon and GitHub under those handles. Um, so this talk will be about supply chain security. So I would like to try to answer two questions. What are digital signatures and why are they so important in this context? Um, so maybe you know this information, but uh, software supply chain attacks have increased of more than 700% during the past three years, which is kind of a huge increase, of course. And a lot of these attacks have been targeting uh, the Python ecosystem, and in particular, the Python packet index. So attackers used techniques like typo squatting or dependency confusion, or also taking um, possession of a maintainer uh, account on PyPI to try to inject malware in uh, important libraries. So um, this increase in malicious package upload was so important that recently PyPI maintainers decided to temporarily suspend new user registrations and package uploads because they got so overwhelmed by those attacks that they couldn't handle the volume of malware anymore and just had to uh, temporarily deactivate this important function. So we're talking about software supply chain. Uh, so I would like to try to define what exactly a supply chain is. So for the sake of this talk, we can say it's like the end-to-end -end journey that software takes from development to distribution, and that involve uh, all the tools and the people that are responsible for delivering the software. So for instance, that is uh, developers, version control systems, build systems, uh, registries, package indices, and also uh, deployment pl platforms and um, production environments. So when you have a supply chain, uh, what attackers play on usually is the expectation of developers that every step in their supply chain is going to be systematically reproducible, uh, which of course is not true. And that creates uh, some kind of vulnerable links that attackers can exploit to um, upload malicious software in your supply chain. Uh, so why are cryptographic signatures or digital signatures important uh, and a key component of every secure supply chain? It's because they offer two uh, guarantees. It's software integrity and software authenticity. So if I were to make some kind of analogy here, uh, I would say cryptographic signatures are like a wax seal on a letter. So it ensures two things usually when you, when you open such a letter. Uh, you can see if the contents of the letter were tampered with, if the seal was open. And also, uh, the pattern on the seal can allow you to identify uniquely the sender of the letter. So it's the same thing with cryptographic signatures. Um, of course, before Sixtor, uh, other um, signing tools existed and other standards. So I think the most famous one was probably OpenPGP uh, or its implementation GPG. Um, but those standards, and in particular PGP, had a bunch of problems that prevented a good developer adoption and uh, didn't allow developer to, to use uh, code signing as a day-to-day -to -day tool. Um, so the first one is public key distribution. Um, so public key distribution is the act of ensuring that your end users are going to be able to identify correctly the public key uh, that you generated. Uh, so we're talking about a symmetric cryptography, so you have a private key that you use to generate the signatures, you have to keep secret. And the public key you need to distribute for people to be able to recognize your signatures. Uh, and in the case of OpenPGP, uh, you have different methods to do that. So uh, it's called public key infrastructure. So uh, it's the infrastructure you put into place uh, so that users can identify your public key. Uh, but the problem is that it's not very standardized, so usually so standards for discovering public keys can widely differ between uh, PKIs. Uh, so for example, you can trust a more centralized uh, certificate authority to say um, what are the good public keys to, to bind to a signer's identity, or uh, in other models like the web of trusts, you can um, trust users, it's more decentralized, so other users can vouch for um, their um, other users' identities. Um, so I put this picture in this slide. Uh, this is called the key signing party, uh, and it happened 
uh, I think in front of FOSDEM 2008. So it's kind of a specific way to verify other people's public key uh, in person. And maybe you will agree it's not very convenient. So if you have to verify a public key by meeting uh, your colleagues in person, it's maybe not the best uh, signing and PKI scheme. So it's quite a specific example, of course. Uh, not all standards are that inconvenient, but still it's a kind of nice illustration, I would say. Uh, another problem of OpenPGP is private key storage and rotation. So private key is, very, is a very important uh, component of asymmetric cryptography because you have to safeguard it at all costs. And that means um, literally in, in terms of uh, costing money. So uh, you don't want to, your, private key to, your private key to leak at all. So you need to invest in some kind of secure storage, for instance, like a hardware security module to guard your key, which is very costly. Um, so you need to invest in specific infrastructure, which also implies uh, specific knowledge about it. So maybe hire uh, people for, especially for this kind of things. Um, and you also need to regularly rotate your private key because compromises are pretty uh, frequent, I would say, and more that you can sing. So you need to also think about rotating your keys also as a best practice. Um, if you've used GPG before, uh, you could agree that the configuration can get quite complex. Uh, so sometimes uh, it's difficult to really understand what you're using and especially what that involves uh, understanding the underlying cryptographic protocols um, when trying to sign an artifact because not everyone, of course, is a cryptography expert. So even if you're a developer, you're not supposed to really care about those things, but sometimes you need to. Uh, so that's not really ideal. Um, I put a reference here to a really good article that was uh, published recently. It's called PGP Signatures on PyPI, Worse and Useless. Uh, you can check the link uh, when the slides will be published. So it explains why um, PGP Signature were removed from PyPI. Uh, so I think the title is pretty explicit, but you can still check the audits made by the blog author to understand why it was not worth uh, continuing to maintain these GPG signatures. Okay, so now it's time to introduce Sixtor, uh, which aims to make uh, code signing easier and more accessible for everyone. Um, so the motto of Sixtor is to become to digital signatures what let's encrypt is to HTTPS. So I will explain what that means. So Sixtor has built built uh, in terms of philosophy on the model of let's encrypt. So if you make a quick comparison between the two services, uh, you can see that Let's Encrypt is a free and automated certificate authority. Uh, so you can use it for uh, at zero cost to obtain TLA certificates to adopt HTTPS for your website. Uh, and in the same way, Sixtor is also a free service that has a public good instance. And you can use it um, as you'd like to log transparently and publicly your, sig uh, publicly your, your signatures. Um, in terms of numbers, Let's Encrypt has stored over uh, 200 million certificates uh, since 2016, which is roughly 3 million certificates issued per day. Um, and Sixtor has uh, stored over 20 million entries since the public good instance went, uh, went up on 2021, when GA. So what exactly is Sixtor? Um, Sixtor is a tool that solves um, some common issues with current signature schemes. Uh, like the ones I talked about before, and that prevented developer adoption. So with Sixtor, you don't need any specific cryptography knowledge or any knowledge of PKI protocols. Uh, it has a very simple interface that makes signing truly accessible to everyone, developer or not. Um, and, you don't, and you don't need to maintain your own private keys anymore. So that's a big advantage because you don't have to invest in all this infrastructure and knowledge uh, at all. It also allows an easier auditing and revocation of signatures in case they get compromised or are faked, for instance, uh, which is still pretty rare. Um, and signatures are bound to a public identity and not uh, to a public key anymore. So that's kind of a big change compared to other asymmetric cryptographic schemes because um, you can bind, for instance, a signature to something more concrete, like an email address that is easily identifiable by a human, uh, not like a public key, for instance. Um, Sixtor is composed of different sub-projects. 
Um, so here I put the three main ones. Um, the first one is ReCore. It's what we call a transparency log, and that's uh, a immutable append-only data structure that allows to store uh, signatures so that everyone can, can be able to verify them. Uh, the second one is Fullsio. Uh, it's a free certificate authority, and it delivers um, ephemeral si signing certificates you can use for um, one-time signing of artifacts, and then that will expire, and that people will not be able to, to reuse after you. So in terms of security, that's a pretty uh, big advantage. And it's used usually, those certificates, to verify the signature result than to sign multiple times, like usual um, signing certificates. And the third sub-project is Cosign. Uh, Cosign is a common line tool, so it's, um, you can use it to sign and verify artifacts in a very, very simple manner. So um, all the cryptographic primitives are picked for you already. You don't need to care about uh, cryptographic protocols. Um, the command line is pretty simple, uh, and you can use it to sign container, containers or uh, blobs, for instance. Uh, in addition to the three projects, you also have a whole ecosystem-specific set of clients. So you have implementations for Golang, JavaScript, Rust, and of course for Python. I will talk about uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so Sixtor has known a pretty large uh, open source adoption since it was created, uh, especially in the cloud native community since it was incubated as a CNCF. Um, so it's pretty well known to be used uh, to sign Kubernetes releases and also uh, released for some other famous projects like Iverno, Tecton, and also the Python library URL lib3. Uh, and it has a lot of integrations with other supply chain projects like Tec Tecton Chains, uh, the update framework, uh, in Toto and Kyverno as well. Okay, so now let's talk about Sixtor uh, in the Python ecosystem more specifically. Uh, so let's go over a few initiatives that the Python community has taken to integrate Sixtor into the ecosystem. Uh, so first of all, uh, Sixtor Python client is available for Python users. Uh, you can do different things with it. So the first thing is use it as a common line tool. Uh, you can sign uh, sign only Python blobs, not containers this time, um, using what we call a keyless signing workflow uh, that we'll explain later, but basically, as you can guess, uh, you don't have to manage private keys using this workflow. Uh, instead, you use um, OpenID Connect, so I will go into, this, into detail about this later. Um, you can also use it in a GitHub Action workflow. Uh, so for example, in your CI, if you want to sign a package release or a build or anything like that, uh, it's pretty easy to use. Um, and you can have uh, signatures as, as output as, uh, of your workflow. Uh, and finally, it has a stable API since version one. You can use to integrate Sixtor natively into a Python project. Uh, if you want to test Sixtor, it's pretty simple. It's a Python package on PyPI, so you can just uh, run pip install Sixtor and start experimenting with it. Um, the Python packaging community also adopted Sixtor. Uh, so Sixtor is appearing in two PEPs in particular. It's PEP 480 and 458, uh, which concern secure, secure downloads of PyPI packages and also uh, everything related to, to software signatures on PayPI. Um, so you, the, the PEPs are accepted right now, uh, not implemented, but uh, I guess you will see soon how Sixtor fits into this picture. So uh, basically it will enable users to upload Sixtor signatures along their packages and modify the API so that uh, clients can also retrieve them and sign, uh, verify the packages upon downloads. Uh, so package managers like PIP, for instance, will also support verifying signatures. And overall, uh, the goal of those PEPs is still to make the user experience similar to before. So it doesn't add any overhead for Python developers when uh, downloading or uploading packages. But it guarantees uh, way more security and integrity. Um, so here I put an example as well of how uh, Sixtor is used in the Python ecosystem. It's to sign releases of CPython. Um, so if you go to the python.org slash download slash Sixtor page uh, to download Python releases, uh, you will see that there are nice, now seen sign using Sixtor. Uh, and here's the command I copy pasted from this site to verify the Sixtor signature. So 
you can have an overview of what it takes. It's not that complex, actually. Uh, so it's just uh, sector verify identity, that's the common line to verify. Then you pass uh, the ephemeral signing certificates, the signature file, and then you pass uh, information about the signer who is uh, the Python release manager for the version. Uh, so his email address and then the URL of the um, identity provider that was used to issue this uh, identity binding. And then you pass, of course, the Python uh, TOR file. Okay, so now I'd like to do a quick demo of signing and verifying a Python file with six for Python. So let me switch to the terminal. Okay. Can everyone see well? Okay, great. Okay, so here we have a file. It's called hello.py, uh, and it does nothing special ex except say uh, hello devconf. So it's a very simple example. So now I'm going to sign it using this keyless workflow that Sixtor Python enables. So I will just type Sixtor sign and then hello.py. Oh, okay, I don't have an internet connection, so that's an issue. <laughs> so sorry about that. Let me check the, the Wi-Fi. redirected to this page uh, by the command line. So here you see that you have a login page appearing. You have different identity providers here, like GitHub, uh, Google, and Microsoft that are officially supported by the Sixtor public instance. Uh, so I'm logged into GitHub, so I will just click uh, login with GitHub. And normally I already have a session open, so um, I would have to normally input my email address and GitHub password, but here I'm already logged in, so the authentication was successful. I can close this page and back to the demo. Okay, so let's have a look at what we got here as an output on this command. Um, so we finished the browser interaction. We got an ephemeral signing certificate here in PEM format. And then you can see this line here um, so it says that it created an entry uh, at index 24 million something in uh, the transparency log. So this is record I talked about earlier. Um, it also re uh, wrote a bunch of files. Uh, so a .sig file, which is a base 64 signature for the artifact, uh, certificates, which is the one printed here, and also a file called a six store bundle that you can use to verify uh, your signatures directly without needing the signature uh, and certificate. So let's take a look at, at what is in the ephemeral certificate. Um, I will use OpenSSL. Okay. So you can see that the issuer is Sixtor. Uh, it's more specifically the Sixtor Public Good Instance uh, Certificate Authority, full show, that issued this signing certificate. Um, other than that, you can see that the SAM is my email address, so I used for authenticated to GitHub. And the um, identity provider is GitHub uh, OOT, so this URL here. And if you look at the, uh, normally at the time, uh, yes. So the not after for the validity is in 10 minutes. So the certificate is only valid for 10 minutes to sign any artifacts I want. So like right now I could reuse it, but in 10 minutes it will be over and it will just be a proof that the certificate was issued uh, to me uh, with a, an ephemeral public key that was generated to sign signature and it was uh, binded to the certificate by full show. So an of official authority approved, um, like confirmed that my uh, GitHub identity was bound, bound to my public key uh, which is bound to the private key, which is ephemeral I used to sign the artifact. All right. So now let's try to verify the signature. So 
here we have all the files uh, we got from the, the signature operation. And now let's try to verify it. So I will just type six for verify identity. Identity. Um, then I will pass cert identity. So that's my email address, the SAN on the certificate. So I'll pick that. The next argument is uh, cert OIDC issuer. So this is the identity provider that was used. So here GitHub um, to sign the, to provide the identity. So I'll just take it and copy paste it. Here. And finally, I will just pass the artifact, uh, which is hello.py. And uh, the files will be found in the same path. So uh, Sixtor just detects this, uh, verification materials we have. Okay, so it says okay. Uh, it means the signature has been successfully verified. So as you can see, it was pretty simple. Uh, you didn't have to configure anything specific, no cryptography, uh, no complex things at all. So that was it for the demo. So now I think we have uh, a bit of time to talk about how exactly that works. So I will try to go over the workflow. Uh, feel free to go over the slides again if it's a bit fast, maybe. Um, so they will be published, so feel free to take a look. So what exactly happened here? Uh, first of all, yes? Uh, sorry? Uh, so this is a Python specific client, but you have other ones. Uh, so for example, Cosine is implemented in Golang. Uh, uh, here it was six store Python. Yes. Um, okay, so how does that work? Uh, first of all, the client generated an ephemeral key pair, so it's still a private and a public key, but they, they are ephemeral, so they just stay in memory during the whole signing process. They never hit the disk, so you never have to see them again. They will get uh, flushed at the end of the uh, signing operation. Then the client will do an identity proof request to one of the identity providers we saw on the uh, authentication login page. So it will ha ask uh, Google, Microsoft, or GitHub, and others in some other configurations for a proof of identity for the signer. Uh, so this is where you log in and enter the proof you, you are the owner of your uh, identity. And then the identity provider will uh, send back to the client a JSON web token, which is called also an ID token, which contains the proof that you, the signed proof actually from the provider that you own your email address. Uh, then a signing client will send, send a signed uh, certificate request to Fullshow, which is the certificate authority uh, that contains uh, the ID token and also um, a certificate that is ready to be signed. And of course, the ephemeral public key to be uh, included in the certificate. Uh, so Fullshow also has a transparency log. Uh, so it's called a certificate transparency log. So when it issues a certificate, it logs it systematically into the CT log so that you can be able to audit for every certificate that was ever issued by full show. So it's also append only and immutable. So you can modify any entries once they are here. So you can have like a full audit of every signing certificate issued ever by this instance. Okay, so it has signed the certificates. So now it sends it back to the client and then the client will uh, sign the artifacts, of course, and then it will upload uh, what you call a log entry into Recore. Um, so Recore is the transparency log I talked about. So it's also apparently an immutable, and then you have a proof of uh, the artifact signature during a given um, time span. Okay, so that was it for the signing part, and not now onto the verification. Uh, so the verifier is also the same uh, client in this case. Uh, so it uses a verification material I showed you uh, earlier. So either only the bundle or uh, certificate and the signature files. And it also requests an inclusion proof um, in, uh, to Recore. So it asks Recore 
uh, if it has seen uh, this entry that was supposed to be included in the log. Uh, if it hasn't, it, will, it won't be able to verify the signature unless you specify that you want to verify offline, but this is more specific to error gapped environments. Um, okay, so that was it uh, for the workflow. Now if you would like to join the Six Tor community if you're interested in contributing, uh, I would like to encourage you to join the Slack, uh, the Six Tor Slack, to subscribe to the YouTube channel, the blog, and to check out the Six Tor.dev website with all the community updates. Uh, so thank you, and now we'll go to the questions. Yes? So what, what was the relationship between the two different logs uh, and um, so actually, they're not really related. Uh, they're kind of different components. They, uh, so the city log, certificate transparency one, uh, serves as a backend to store certificates uh, issued by, by Fulcio. And the record serves to, to uh, store um, signature entries. So it's two different components. But they are the same. Uh, actually, the, they have the same backend. It's called Trillion. It's a Merkle tree data structure. So it's used uh, for the same purpose, basically. Yes? Uh, so if I understand correctly, the, the certificates are signed by a certificate authority. Yes. And is that unique to this public instance of six store, or is there a federation of certificate authorities that are related to one store? So uh, in this case, oh, OK, sure. So I will repeat the question. Uh, the question is, if um, it is the same uh, certificate authority that signs uh, the certificates for full seal, the same backend, or if there is a federation of uh, CAs, is that correct? Yeah, between different it's instances of six store and server. OK. Uh, so in this case, uh, I talked about the six store public good instance. Uh, so this is one instance of six store that is maintained by the community. Uh, I think you also have a staging instance, but it's more for testing purposes. Uh, but in general, you can use this public instance, but you can also install Sextor and bootstrap it on your own. Uh, so you can have a different CA backend in this case. Uh, you can choose from, from other backends if you, if you have your own infrastructure. Um, yes? Yes. Um, yes. Um, so cosine is used to sign containers. Uh, that's the first use case of, of cosine, and six store Python doesn't support that. Uh, and the goal of implementing uh, different uh, clients for different ecosystems is to support uh, native integrations into projects. So you can expose an API on, on each library and integrate six store directly into your project. Isn't there a risk of we we have a client So the question was Okay, so the question was, wasn't there a risk that um, different clients will do, um, like, will implement six store differently, like the six store protocol? Um, so I think uh, the community has been pretty good for thinking on this kind of issues. So usually uh, you have normally a working group for clients, so people coordinate so that the protocol is still similar uh, according to the implementation, so you have some kind of community agreement on what's supposed to happen here. Yes? Oh, sorry, could you repeat? So the public instance runs uh, its own. It's maintained by the community, but you can also install it on your own if you want to support a private instance of Sixtor. Um, sorry, I didn't understand the last part. Um, so let's say I have a multiple package of libraries, and there's all these other packages. Um, how am I supposed to know what the correct identity of the size of that package is? 
Okay, so how am I supposed to know the uh, correct identity for each package signer? So that's a very good question. Uh, in fact, I think you, you need to be aware of it. Uh, or you can just, uh, yes, I mean, it's in the certificate, but obviously you need to know what you're verifying. Uh, you can't just check any email address, so you need to know in advance uh, what is the email address or identity you're looking for in this case. Yes? Um, which information? Okay, so the question was, is the information about signers uh, provided on PyPI? Uh, so at the moment, it's not implemented yet, so I, I don't know exactly how it will be in the future, but I guess it's, uh, yes, we will see that when uh, the PEP uh, 480 and 458 are actually implemented. I, I, I don't know yet how the API is going to look like, so, yeah. Any other question? Yes? Okay, so the question was, does it support having a single artifact signed by multiple people? Uh, so yes, of course. Uh, you can generate uh, as many signature or certificate files as you want. Uh, so you just can store them in the same place, to, uh, of course, but of course, yes. Um, yes? <coughs> Oh, that, that's a very good question. So there's no line in this diagram between Fulcio and the identity provider, but in fact, you're right. Uh, so Fulcio recognizes only a set of identity providers. So uh, you can choose if you have your own instance which uh, identity providers to trust. Uh, in the case of the public instance, it's a community agreement as well. But you're right that, uh, of course, Fulcio has a configuration and it specifies uh, which identity providers it's trusting. So yes, that's true. Other questions? So the question was if uh, six row Python was going to support container signing. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, I don't think so. Uh, I didn't see any community initiative in this in this sense. Uh, so I, I'm not sure at all. I don't think that's the plan as of now. Yes? Um, uh, so the question was, I sh we should be able to sign containers with, uh, with six or Python as it's, uh, it's also a file. Um, so the thing is that, you, you have the signature part and then you have the storage part in an OCI registry, uh, which is a bit more complex and uh, necessitates some other uh, kind of implementation. So you need to know like how to store the signature uh, compared to where the image is stored on an OCI registry. So it's not so something that 6 or Python is supporting right now. It's, it's what, sorry? Yes, exactly. So the question was if the client um, uploaded the signature into VIPI. Uh, so not yet, because it's not yet supported, but um, they're planning on it. Yes. Okay. So I mentioned I can revoke the signature. So, um, so I, I don't think that's exactly the formulation I used, but um, six store makes auditing easier in general because thanks to the transparency log, you can know exactly uh, if you have, for example, if you know. Um, when an identity was compromised, if that's the case, for instance, you can know exactly what artifacts to revoke. So it makes, uh, you can't really revoke artifacts, um, but you can know which artifacts not to trust and you can pull down from uh, your environment. Yes. Would 
the question is, uh, would record be able to record the fact that artifacts were compromised? Um, I think this is not the case, but I need to check again the structure of a record entry, but I don't think record has this capability as of now. I can get back to you on this. I have to verify. Okay, so we're out of time. So thank you uh, for attending. <laughs>